The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. message is Living Under the Influence. Memorize that title because we're going to get some deliverance in this service. So, uh, under the, Living Under the Influence. Now, back in the day before I was a believer, uh, uh, a lot of my friends were on drugs and, uh, you know, everyone's heard of DUI, driving under the influence, whether it's alcohol or drugs. Um, living under the influence, but I can remember when I first became a believer, I had uh, unsaved friends that said, oh, that's a crutch. And, uh, you know, they have a free will, and uh, they're, they're free to do whatever they want. But uh, we come to learn later, scripturally, as a believer, that freedom is always expressed under a law. And uh, Romans 8, 2 says, for the law of the spirit of life and Messiah Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. They think they're doing what they want to do, but think about it. Even unsaved people who say, oh, I don't need that Jesus crutch. I don't need that kind of, uh, I have a free will. But if they were honest, there's things that they can't quit doing, that they'd like to quit doing. There's some things that they can't fulfill, and they're not able to do it no matter how hard they try. So it's true what Scripture says, that freedom is expressed under a law, and it's either the law of life or it's the law of sin and death. And to be free from the law of sin and death, it's actually an exchange of one law for another. So living under the influence. Uh, God's been speaking to me about, uh, uh, not instead of D-U-I, it's L-U-I, living under the influence. And... The, kind of the subtitle here that uh, God has spoken to me in times past is uh, from the scriptures, forefathers, and understanding how we are influenced or living under the influence of forefathers. And there is, uh, <clears throat> first of all, scripture says the devil, remember Jesus told the Pharisees, your father's the devil. Uh, you're of your father, the devil. And poor Peter, there was times where he was under the influence. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, for you don't know what spirit you're of. You don't know what influence you're under. And everyone is under an influence, even the ones that think they're so free. You know, the ones that are so free that they don't even believe in a devil because uh, they don't believe in God, they don't believe in a devil. And uh, actually, the devil's best servants or best slaves are the ones that don't believe he's there. But you can always identify a tree by its fruit. And we're going to cover some of the ways to uh, identify the fruit. You know, discernment is actually to be able to uh, be aware of the source of something. Uh, not just the manifestation, but what was the source of the manifestation? What influence am I under? What is influencing us even as believers? So we're going to talk about uh, uh, living under the influence of four fathers. One, the devil. Two, God the Father, which is ultimately what you want to be living under the influence of. Three, uh, earthly fathers. How, how did they influence our lives and how, how did we respond according to earthly fathers? And then lastly, spiritual fathers or mentors. And in some cases, your father, the natural father, could be uh, a mentor and a spiritual father as well. But most of the time, it's different. Most of the time, many people have been raised in homes where uh, the parents weren't even Christian. And so they often went to seek out answers to hard questions and how do I live this life, and so to speak. But I want to start with uh, uh, <clears throat> living under the influence of the devil. Um, it's interesting that you can be religious and still under the influence. Listen to this portion of scripture <clears throat> in, uh, in John. 
uh, verse 38, uh, it says, I speak what I have seen with my father. Now, Jesus is saying, I'm under the influence of my father, Father God. And you do what you have seen with your father. Uh-oh, he's making a distinction here to these religious people. And they answered in him, of course, they're indignant. There's some fruit there manifesting as to what influence they're under. Uh, argumentation, uh, anger, hostility. Abraham is our father. And Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me. Uh-oh. Now listen to this. He's saying, you're under the influence of the devil, your father, because now you seek to kill me. I don't care if that's character assassination, someone that's always uh, bad-mouthing somebody else. Uh, it's a form of murder. And you can murder, if you even say your brother fool, you're guilty. And it says, but now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God, or my father. Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds of your father. Then they said to him, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, and that's God. And Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would have loved me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. And why do you not understand my speech? Because you're not able to listen to my word. You are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth. Because there's no truth in him, when he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own resources. He's a liar, a murderer, and when he speaks, this father, the devil, is a murderer from the beginning. Isn't it interesting in the Ten Commandments, the first thing you're taught, that the key commandments... Uh, that you learn is thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not commit adultery. And it's one is one is living a lie and the other one is is killing. The devil father is a murderer and he is the father of lies. You know, in first John two, even even in an admonition to believers, first John two, fifteen and sixteen says, Do not love the world. If you love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, this is not of the Father. So now you're identifying influences in your life. If you, you can love the world, you know, there's there's people that um, uh, they're probably sunshine believers, but uh, they will go to church, they'll do everything, but when it comes time to saying uh, a statement like, uh, if it, oh, ask any believer, do you love God? And they'll say, I love God, but are you in love with God? There's a big distinction between being in love with someone and saying you love. I mean, I love my car, I love my dog, I love my house, I love Jesus. You can have them all on an equal plane. But when it's the preeminence of the Lordship of Jesus and you're under his influence, you're in love with him. You're becoming part of the bride. You're being prepared to be that bride. John 14, 30, Jesus himself in his earth walk said, the ruler of this world, interesting what he called the devil, huh? The ruler of this world is coming, but he has nothing in me. In other words, he's coming, he's pure evil, he's the ruler of this world that I'm walking an earth walk, but I only do what I see my father doing. I only say what I hear my father saying. And he has nothing in me. He has no influence over me. Isn't that beautiful? Wouldn't you like to let that be your testimony? That the world, the flesh, and the devil has no influence over me. Now, uh, you were dead at one time. That's what it says in, uh, in the New Testament. You were dead in your trespasses in Ephesians. You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked. So this is talking about a conversion. This is talking about sons and daughters of God, where God is their father. And he's saying, you formerly walked according to the age of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the devil, 
the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Oh yes, all, all those people that don't need God, don't believe in God, don't believe in the devil, they are walking as sons of disobedience under the influence. They think they're doing whatever they want to do, but in reality, there's a whole lot of things you can't do and there's a whole lot of things you can't quit doing in your own strength. You are under the influence and it's not good. But for believers, you've been transformed. You've been delivered. You once, it says, among them, we also once lived in those lusts. We were under that authority. We exchanged authority. We, went, we changed fathers, didn't we? We went from the father to the devil, whether we knew him or not. We were under his influence, and your unsaved, uh, unsaved children are under this influence, and they think that they're free. And again, we said, uh, I said it earlier, but it, it's true, and it needs worth mentioning. The most in bondage people... And the devil's best slaves are the ones who think he doesn't exist, and they will even tell you how free they are. The challenge is, if you're so free, why haven't you succeeded? If you're so free, why haven't you gotten set free from those things you can't quit doing? But it says, you once lived in the lust of the flesh, doing the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and you were by nature children of wrath. There it is. What, what, there's an indication of the influence you were under when the father was your devil. You were a person of wrath. Hostility is in the world right now to a large degree, and you see it everywhere. And I don't care if they try to call it uh, uh, justification, um, uh, you know, even, even, you know, while it's necessary. Uh, there's so much hostility that it's coming from the influence that you're under. You know, that old life, walking in the vanity of your minds, walking in, in darkened understanding, uh, excluded from the life of God. Yeah, that's sad, isn't it? That's why we pray for the unsaved, because they're, they're living excluded from God. They're living apart from the life that is, could be available. It could be theirs. They're calloused. They've given themselves over to sensuality uh, to practice every kind of impurity and greediness. They live in the futility of their mind. Their understanding is darkened. Isn't it funny that understanding is darkened? And even Jesus to the Pharisees, you, uh, your father's a devil and you can't, my words are not in you. You can't even receive my words. They can't receive the word because of the hardness of their heart. They're past feeling and insensitive. Uh, they're lewd, unclean, and they have a blinded heart that can't receive so be not surprised when someone can't receive their word. It's because uh, the love of God's not in their heart. But you did not learn this as a believer. If indeed you have heard him and been taught by him, the Holy Spirit, as that truth is in Jesus, that you put off the former way of life and the old nature, which is a corrupt according to deeds. Um, God basically is telling me this is going to be a deliverance service and you're going to be, even in just the listening to this, you're going to be finding that there's going to be things that are going to be lifting off of you, but you have to recognize the influence. You know, uh, one of the characteristics of the, the devil as a father was uh, found in Isaiah 14. There's the five I wills, very willful, arrogant. Uh, I will ascend into heaven. This is uh, Isaiah 14, 13 and 19. It's an indication of the influence. In other words, it's one thing to say, uh, this is the devil. It's another thing to say, how does he operate? And, and if you are under his influence, what attributes would you be carrying around with you? Well, one of them is uh, exaggeration. Yep, that's right. He's a liar from the beginning, an exaggeration. And he says with great latitude, I will ascend into heaven. All right. Uh, Self-importance, uh, pumping yourself up and exaggerating. The second thing, I will exalt my throne above the stars, an uncontrolled ambition. Uh, it's interesting that, uh, that the enemy would just love to, the father, the devil, he would just love you to be ambitious to the point where he can wear you out, to the point where he can drive you and impel you and make you perform for him. Like a little puppet on a string when you belong to him. We, we need set free from those kinds of influences. The third I will of Isaiah 14. I will sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. Domination. 
it wants to dominate. You see people that are under the influence of the enemy, they got to have the last word. They have to rule even in the discussion. It's, a, it's an attribute of domination. Uh, but I'll tell you what, God's going to have the last word. And that is an indication of self-will. It's an indication of the law of self-will. And these are five sins of the will that got Lucifer in trouble. Now, Lucifer was very braggadocious as far as saying, I will, I will, I will, I will. But I will ascend to the heights of the clouds, position. I like position. There's people that they're not even greedy for money. They want the power more than they want money. And in places where, where they can ascend the heights, they have a position. And they, they drink and get drunk on the power. I will be like the most high. Imitation. I even think some people get into debates for the wrong reason. They're not seekers of truth. They have to win. They have to dominate. They have to have the last word. That's a work of the flesh, and it's under the influence of the father and the devil. You don't need that influence in your life. Now, I will ascend above the heights. That's for position. But here's the part that's very interesting. It's something that, as believers, we should let the Word of God discern us more clearly and more fully on a regular basis. That's why we, we His Word my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches in glory. God's glory is, is his word, and his word is a manifestation of him, and we should let him, his word, discern us. You know, it's one thing to discern what's going on in the world around you. It's one thing to discern uh, uh, as a gift of the Spirit, but it's more important that the Word discern you first so that you can see what influence am I under and are all of the influences that I'm under, are they of God? I don't want to be under the influence of any voice. I am under the government of voice, the Word of God. And when the Word discerns me, I don't want to be like those Pharisees. They were know-it-alls. They were scholars. They knew the Bible. And what did he say? You don't have any room in your heart for me. You can't receive me. But you could quote the Word. You could be a student of the Word, but you cannot receive truth because there's no place in you because of lies, exaggerations, power, dominations, position. But lastly, it says, I will be like the Most High God. That means I'm going to imitate. And we know this for a fact. The reason even the elect could be deceived from time to time is because imitation. The enemy creates nothing new. He tries to imitate from a murderous heart, to rob, kill, and to destroy. From a murderous heart, he tries to imitate what God would do. So he wanted to be like God. He wanted to be worshipped. And unfortunately, those, he doesn't really get the last word, though. Those are all the things he, was, he wanted and desired. But ultimately, it says in verse 19 of Isaiah 14, but you're cast down out of the grave like an abominable branch, like a garment of those that are stained thrust through with a sword, who go down to the stones of the pit like a corpse trodden underfoot. No, it's I will, I will, I will. No, you shall be brought down. And so what goes up must come down. And before a fall, pride comes. And that was his downfall. Now, the identifying uh, Lucifer or the devil as a father is understanding what his influences are and how we want to be set free from any of those influences. Judas was a disciple of Jesus. He fell for the devil, didn't he? He came under his influence. Peter, poor Peter. I mean, pillar of the church and yet... Jesus had to say, get behind me, for you don't know what spirit you're of. You do not know what influence is affecting you right now. But guess what? The Spirit of God knows. And if we would really inquire and require Him as our vital necessity, we would know what influence is God. What is, what is God the Father? What are His attributes? What is His character? You know, all through the Scriptures, all the names of God, every one of them is depicting a attribute, a character quality, we just know it as God is love. And yes, he is. God is love. Our father is love. 
but he calls himself Elohim. Elohim was the God of power and might. Our Father has got all power, 100% total power and might. He's the God of creativity. He's the only one that creates. Father the devil, he doesn't create anything. He imitates. But God is a creative God, and he, put, and he made you in his image. That means on the inside of you, in your human spirit, is creativity. If you will allow it to emerge, God will see you fulfill your plans and the purposes that he has for your individual lives. He planned before you were formed in your mother's womb. He knew you, and your, 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 your life was written on a tablet in a book. And God said, creativity to be a unique, one-of-a-kind individual is in you. It's in seed form, and it needs to be watered, nourished, and grow, but it's in there. And you're a one-of-a-kind. There's not two other kinds. It reminds me of uh, in uh, the book of Esther how the king gave all of the people in this huge banquet a celebration. He gave them goblets, but there was no two goblets alike. It was depicting their individuality, the gift from the king to your individuality. You're a one of a kind. It's like uh, we could all be uh, have that diamond in us but ultimately we are all individual settings and there's no two alike. Now, God is a Elohim, he's a creator God, but he, he's also, our father wants to make a covenant. He's desperate for, for a relationship. He wants a relationship with us. He's also called Jehovah. Jehovah is actually the revealing one. He not only wants to make a covenant with us, he wants to be the God of power and might, he wants to make a covenant, the greater with us, the lesser. What an honor. If you truly understood being under the influence of God, you would, honor would be part and parcel of your Christian life. You would understand honoring, honoring authority, honoring those uh, above you, because honor would be built in. Humility would be the attachment to God. And pride, of course, we know is a step out of that relationship. So... God the Father comes across as the God of creativity, the God of power and might, the God who wants to make a covenant, the greater with the lesser. He's also uh, Jehovah, uh, the revealing one. He can't wait to reveal something to you. You know, when I first discovered that truth, I found all of these attributes of God, all of these characteristics, all of these things that were uniquely said about God and his word. I let that word discern me, but then I long to walk and enjoy a relationship with that character attribute. And right now I believe God's saying that I, I am, I am uh, your savior. I'm your deliverer. I am your forgiver who cleanses you from your sin. And I am the one that will comfort you. And I believe that he's going to give the comfort to a lot of people, but there's going to be a deliverance that's going to take place. He's manifesting himself even right this moment as a deliverer. He wants to deliver you from undue influence of the enemy. That yes, even as a believer, you can still be under the voice of the world, the flesh, and the devil. You can hear constant bombardment of things coming through the news, coming through the media, coming through, and it's, it's we are under the government of voice, and it's his report, and it's his word, that we should submit to. Now, he's also called El Shaddai. Oh, I just love it. El Shaddai, the mighty breasted one, the God who is more than enough. If you're living in lack, there is already under the enemy who robs, kills, and destroy. If you're living under lack, you're living under the wrong influence because my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory. And that means that he is uh, the mighty breasted one, the one who is more than enough, the one who works contrary to nature. Uh, I love that uh, worship song that, uh, that we do often about the way maker. Uh, he makes a way where there doesn't seem to be a way. He's a miracle worker. That's, that's what El Shaddai, he's the, the God of multiplication, the God who is, operates contrary to nature to make things happen. That's right, he created it so he can operate contrary to nature. And He's the Almighty God, the God of blessing, multiplication, power and might, blessing, nourishment, abundance. My God shall supply all of your need. So if you're living in any kind of lack, any area, identify the lack. 
and simply say, that is an area where you're under the wrong influence because my God shall supply all of your need. Now, you need to go to where the glory is at. His riches are in glory. His riches are in his presence. You have to make sure that there's not something in you that doesn't allow his word to enter in. You've got arguments or what have you. And then lastly, something that I believe is a very portion of these aspects of God is the Father. Things that I believe are very significant is Adonai. Out of all the names of God, Adonai has to do with ownership. Am I Remember we said early on that uh, the scripture says in Romans 8, 2, for the law of the spirit of life in Messiah Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. You have to change authorities. You have to change who's ruling in your life. One law of sin and death for the law of the spirit of life. You need not just a savior, you need a Lord. You need to make him Lord, Adonai, Lord and Master. It's our responsibility to be a little love slave of the Lord Jesus. And God himself, as Lord, will be those that walk in the kingdom. You know, the gospel of the kingdom is a, is a, is a truth that needs to be understood in its, simplest, in its simplicity, really. It's returning to the simplicity that's in Jesus is the kingdom of God is within you. So if my God is going to supply all of my need according to his riches and glory, the scripture says, Jesus in you is the hope of glory. And the kingdom of God is within you. And the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's, that's the realm of his lordship. And it's the realm of love. Righteousness, peace, and joy is the realm of love. It's the kingdom of love. It's the banner of love over us. It's, the, it's depicting the influence that's on our life. The influence on our life and being under the influence. I want to be under the influence. Humble myself under the mighty hand of God that he might exalt you. Lucifer wanted to exalt himself. Wrong father, wrong influence. We don't need that. We don't need to promote ourselves. We don't need to be seen and heard. We don't need to have the last word because ultimately God will have the last word and it won't be favorable if you're going to argue against it. Now, here's the part that I feel is, is, is important. We saw what the father, the devil looks like and being under his influence. We saw a little bit, just a taste of, of what, what God the father looks like according to scriptures. Just looking at his names and his attributes. And we know that God is love. Our father is love. But there are misconceptions to this father. Misconceptions like, uh, okay, let's, let's get down to real practical here, down to the nitty-gritty of where even Christians live. The child does not run the house. Oh, you mean you could actually have this impression that you boss God around? He's, he's this uh, uh, heavenly butler to attend to whatever your needs are? No, the child does not run the house. If you have any of that flavor in your life, and in some cases, it will show even in your families if you start to let the kids run the house and you want to be their friend and their buddy. No, someone needs to be the adult. Someone needs to be the parent. So you're under a wrong influence there. God is not your heavenly butler. And no, the child does not run the house. You are to hear what the, what did Jesus say? Wasn't he the perfect example? And he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. He said that to Philip, but he said, I only do what I see my father doing. I only say what I hear my father doing. That beautiful submission. And even on the cross, when he, when he was dying on the cross, he said, I go to my Abba and your Abba. I go to my father and your father. He was submitted to the end, from beginning to end. Now, the other thing is, uh, misconceptions about the father uh, can be distance. Distance is a deception. This is one that I had to find. According to his riches and glory, I had to find a solution because uh, I found that I had distance with my earthly father. And it was amazing for me to discover that distance was a deception. This covenant-making God 
wanted a relationship with me. His thoughts were continually toward me. I was overwhelmed with the goodness of God. But I went from being under the influence of my earthly father to the influence of my heavenly father. So you can make the exchange. The exchange is a radical exchange to get your needs met according to his riches in where? Glory. So you're going to go to him to get your needs met. Trying to make it for yourself, overcompensating for what you didn't have. Uh, I know initially I was ignored and rejected, so I wanted to make myself seen and heard. <laughs> you just overcompensate. Trying to get a need met unrighteously. But distance was a deception. Just because it was like that with an earthly father. You know. Then there's the other one. Uh, I've seen this from time to time over the years that there's even the misconception of the Father God. Um, people that are hurt and wounded, they go church to church. Nobody believes like I believe. They want everything to be exactly the way they are comfortable with. So it's for them, God is a God of convenience. It must suit my taste and my comfort rather than conviction. Rather than be welcoming change and, and adjusting to what would, what would please my Heavenly Father, it's more like I'm looking to please what my comfort zone. And so they go church to church, and of course, uh, nobody preaches the truth. Uh, I, I guess they have a special handle on it that no one else has ever discovered it. So, but in reality, their God is a God of convenience. He's there if I want Him, but pretty much I'm living on my own under the prince of the power of the air, even as a believer. I'm just going and doing whatever I feel like I want to go and do whenever. And God forbid that it's inconvenient. There's, there's, a, there's a test right there. Some people need deliverance on that. You, 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 you orchestrate your do's and your don'ts by what is convenient, not by what is the will of God. And that convenience is a sign that the independent self is more under the influence of the world, the flesh, and the devil than it is under God. Because you're playing God. Then there's the other one. Oh, all of us as pastors have seen this one. This is the one that comes in. And even if they call for help, they're always calling for help about condemnation. God is the big punisher in the sky that just wants to smash them like a bug. And if they make a mistake, they're like, they live in this uh, overwhelming condemnation. And they're driven. And in many cases, one of the signs of that uh, devil, the father, is he drives and impels where the Holy Spirit, the love of the father, leads and guides but when they're driven to rebel, they're trying to fix their mistakes. And often the, the, the fixing of their mistakes, when they're under a religious spirit, under the prince of the power of the air, even as a believer, is overcompensating. They're trying to fix stuff that never needed to be fixed. You're trying to work penance. Remember that concept? Penance is like a punishment to obey the law. I've got to obey the law. And what, what does it miss? What does, what does it miss when you let, when you let uh, the proper influence affect your heart? It's the law versus love. It's the law of life in Jesus that sets you free. The law didn't work for the Pharisees very well, did it? It only hardened their heart, and when truth came, they couldn't even receive the truth. They're living in exaggeration. They're living in pride. They were living in position, power, dominance. They liked all of that. They liked it so much so that they were not open to receive truth. Now, <clears throat> then every now and then there's even those with the misconception that, oh, maybe, maybe I'm not a total unbeliever, but I think I'll, I think I'll ask Jesus to come in on my deathbed so that I can make sure that I'm doing everything that I want to do myself now. Everything that's convenient for me. That's not going to work. You may be, you may be surprised that you're not going to have time for such a thing. That's, a, that's under the influence of the world, the flesh, and the devil. 
Now, um, now we know that God is love. And I believe that what, what we need to understand is our earthly fathers. If there is an indication that no matter how much we love the Word and how much we, we read the Word and let the Word discern us, we run into things to where if we were honest, and we're going to need deliverance on this even today, we are still under the influence of our earthly fathers and we see God the way we saw them. That has to change. Your perception, and that comes from what we call bitter roots, and there's laws of relationship. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever you sow, you reap. So if you believe that your father was a punisher, until you forgive him, you will reap that impression of even God. God's out to punish you all the time. You forgive the earthly father who was the punisher, and you begin to see the mercy and the grace and the love that the Father has. You have to exchange it because sowing and reaping is a law of relationship. Uh, if you dishonor them, I can remember Jennifer telling uh, young kids in a BEH class, uh, behavior problematic children that the teachers couldn't handle. She said, boys, the things you judged your fathers for, you're going to reap someday by doing the same thing. Even though you said you hate them, you're going to do the same thing. It's a law. You don't have to believe in this law. It's like gravity. You drop something and it falls. You don't have to believe in that law, but it's going to work. Well, the law of sowing and reaping is a, is a principle for both Christian and secular realm. I mean, if an unsaved person uh, was a politician and he went and sowed good deeds, he's going to reap votes. All right? Sowing and reaping is an overarching principle that it's going to operate whether you like it or not. And so, boys, you forgive your fathers and you won't do the same thing. Boys, the things you judged your mother for, someday you may reap through your wife. How many marriage, marriages do pastors hear where they say, ah, he's, uh, she's just like my mother? <laughs> yeah. Well, guess what? <laughs> You've got some other issues that you probably never resolved. Oh, he's just like my father. Yep. You've got some father issues you never resolve. I'll tell you what, before you get married, that's when some of that covenant clicks in. You judged your parent a certain way. And you will become a parent someday. And if that judgment isn't there, you will do the same thing. Boy, doesn't that get you upset? We saw them get, the children got pretty upset with that. They didn't like that law, sowing and reaping. In other words, I want to be free to hate them. And, and that means I'm going to be a hateful person. Uh-oh. <laughs> There's a problem with this. You who judge, you will do the same thing. And the measure you use will be measured right back to you. Uh, <clears throat> the sowing and reaping, it gets conceived in the heart birth something toxic and when it grows up it produces bad fruit. Isn't it clear that as a believer we always know them by their fruit? Well, your earthly father, I think we should even uh, do some of that right now. Um, <clears throat> I always liked listening to uh, uh, David's epitaph. Now, Proverbs, this is one for the refrigerator. I always said every parent that has little children ought to put Proverbs 30, verse 17. The eye that mocketh his father and scorns his mother, obedience to his mother, the ravens of the field will pick out its eye. That ought to get the attention of the little guys. But at the same time, listen to David. David was a king. David was a man loved by God. He fulfilled the purposes of God for his generation. Uh, uh, and yet, in his epitaph, meaning what he said of himself at the end, that I'm the son of Jesse, a man who is anointed by God, a worshiper. I know where I came from. I'm just a son of Jesse. 
He didn't say, I was a great king. I was a great warrior. He said, I'm a man, the son of Jesse, a man anointed by God, and a sweet psalmist of Israel. I'm a worshiper. That's, this is his, he had a healthy view of himself. And ultimately, the spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord, and it searches all the innermost rooms of the belly. I believe some of you are going to get deliverance when you start right now, right where you're at. You start forgiving mother and father. Maybe they didn't give you what you needed, but you know what? I'm going to show you how to get those needs met righteously. But it's not going to happen until you first and foremost forgive them. If you won't forgive, your Heavenly Father's hands are tied as far as facilitating any kind of quality change in your life. Don't you want to have a quality change in your life? Don't you want to do differently? Don't you want to be all that God called you to be and to do all that God called you to do? I believe that's in you, but I believe that right now, I want you to close your eyes right where you're at. I want you to picture mom or dad, whichever one comes up first. And I want you to allow yourself to feel What is that? Is it a wall? Is it a negative feeling? Is it an apprehension? Whatever it is, it's coming between you and Father God. And the Lord told me, Dennis, don't let anything come between what you and I have together. And that's a word for you. Don't let anything come between what you and God could have together. And if there's an uneasy feeling in the gut when you picture your dad or your mom, I want you to let Jesus in you, the forgiver. That's the forgiver living in you and that new creation you and you're a, you, th together you're allowing a river of loving forgiveness to flow from your innermost being and remove that barrier. Now, maybe you're forgiving your dad for rejection. Maybe you you're forgiving your mother for not keeping you feeling safe or secure. But God wants you to see that really what he can do now is he can cause you to receive from his riches in glory. You can receive all that you needed and didn't receive. All that I needed from dad or mom. All that I needed. You'd pray this on your own. All that I needed and didn't receive. I'm going to open my heart to receive and get it from God. I'm going to get deliverance from this being under the influence of my judgments against mother or father. I dishonor them. And in that dishonor, I am reaping the harvest. Day, today is a day of salvation. Today is a day of deliverance. I need to be set free from those judgments because I am imposing them or projecting them on authority figures all around, even including projecting them on myself to where if they were a strict parent, I've chosen to be a lenient parent. That means you're not healed up. Be doing the opposite of what your parents did does not mean you're healed. That's an act of uh, effort to change in your independent self. That is not freedom. You're still under the law of sowing and reaping. Now, God's basically going to take us down and he's going to show us how, as a believer, am I going to make progress? And well, I'm going to show you how to deal with this individually, but I'm also going to tell you the importance of even having a spiritual father. A spiritual father or mentors in your life are important. Why? Because you have to ask yourself, what is it I really want? What, uh, what am I doing to get what I want? I, I, is it working? If not, would you like a better plan? A little reality therapy? Well, here's something that the early church did 
oh, even before they had the Gospels, utilizing the Old Testament scriptures, these new Gentile believers, they were, they were instructed and they were called my child. Isn't that a beautiful term? Here's these Gentiles coming into a relationship with Messiah Jesus. They're a new believer. Their culture has, they've been under the influence of their culture in, in a tremendous way. Uh, their belief system has been totally infused with culture, much like it is today. And this reparenting process became real. And I, I love this, I've always loved this quote that even in their instruction manual, in, in uh, the, the, the Didache, they would, they would take Old Testament scriptures and they would fashion them because these, these new Gentile believers, they didn't have Ten Commandments. They didn't, they didn't have a scriptural foundation. They had a cultural foundation. They were under the influence of the prince of the power of the air and their culture. The voice of the world, the flesh, and the devil is what shaped them and their identity. God's saying, I'm going to reparent them, and I'm going to give them people in their life. I'm going to give them mothers and fathers in God to reparent them. And, and here's one of the sayings. This is a rabbinic uh, traditional saying, one that goes way back to anyone who teaches Torah to the son of his fellow is considered as if he fathered them. For his father brought him into the world, but his master who taught him wisdom will bring him into the life of the world to come. The sage who opens up the life of the world to come is prized over the father who brought him into the world. God was honored as father of Israel and as the father of the king of Israel. This reparenting is that anybody can have a child. Anybody can father a child. But teaching them how to live life in the kingdom is superior to that. Now, hopefully we would like to believe that all fathers that are spiritual, that are Christian fathers would be the mentors as well. But let's face it, that's not always the way it was. I know I was the only Christian in my family at the time when it was. I needed mentors. I needed people to run things by. I did a lot of rash things. I did a lot of wrong things. I did some things right. But I had mentors that would say, Dennis, you don't want to do it that way. Or Dennis, you could do it this way. And it was, it was significant. And I was reparented by leaders. So we do need spiritual parents. Do you have a father in your house? Do you have mentors that you uh, look to? Because this, uh, this, this fatherhood was based not upon God's activity in creating, but upon his election that God has appointed relationships. He has appointed the exact time and the exact place you should live, and he has appointed people in your life to help shape and mold and go. I, I, I love this, uh, the one speaking to you, the word of God should be honored. Honor them who have rule over you, uh, as the scripture says. But it's, it's no surprise that the mentor related to the one being trained as my child. Uh, for indeed, the spiritual father or mother was doing for the novice what, what even their own parents were unable to do for them nurturing them into the life that come. Some of my favorite scriptures where we see, because I always pictured that Apostle Paul is kind of a gruff, rough guy, right? I know what he was doing before his Damascus Road experience, and I'd say he was a pretty intense individual, you know? Probably one that looked me in the eyes, I might get a little nervous there. But uh, listen, to, listen to the way he spoke in Thessalonians. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 7 and 11, but we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. And as you know, how we exhorted and comfort and charged every one of you as a father does to his children. He's talking about motherhood and fatherhood coming out of the creativity and coming out of the influence that God had over his life. He is now mentoring or having influence over others. But what he's really doing is reparenting, isn't he? Any of their shortcomings, any of the difficulties that they had, uh, he's basically saying, I am reparenting in the context that as a spiritual father, or, or, I am 
as a nursing mother. That's a characteristic of God, the nurturer, El Shaddai. That's part of the love of God. As a nursing mother cherishes her own children, and as a father, exhort, comfort, charge, as a father does his own children. The mother can comfort them, give them all jelly sandwiches, pack their lunch, send them off to school. But the father should be saying, you need to accomplish this. You can do it. You have this gift. You have this ability. Let's cultivate that gift. Let's pull that gift out. You need both. You don't need just one. You don't need just someone to give you, pack your lunch, and make sure you're safe and secure. You need to be challenged to rise to the occasion in life because life's not fair. And you're going to have to learn how to navigate in this world. And as a parent, I want you to navigate, as a spiritual parent, I want you to navigate in the kingdom of God. I want you to be able to walk the walk and talk the talk. So, for this reason, I've sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved son. 1 Corinthians 4, 17. For this reason, I sent Timothy, who is my beloved son and faithful son in the Lord. He will remind you of my ways in Jesus as I teach everywhere in every church. And you know his proven character, that like a son unto his father, he served with me the gospel. I can still remember in the early instruction of the church, when the Gentiles first came in and said, uh, they were told, see to it that nobody leads you astray, because he does not teach you according to what God's teaching you. Well, if he's not teaching according to God, he's teaching to the, the, to the world, the culture. And it's very popular now to give in to peer pressure. It's very popular right now to want to be in the majority rather than teaching a person to think for themselves and stand on their own two feet. Anybody can go to college and get indoctrinated. I don't care how smart you are. I don't care where you're at on the bell curve. Anybody. You just submit because you'll be made fun of if you think differently. But God's basically saying, my thoughts are higher than their thoughts and my ways are higher than their ways. And that is what I want incubating in you so that the word is written on the tablet of your heart. Now, um, all of us, all of us have needs and uh, legitimate needs. And perhaps your fathers or your spiritual fathers had shortcomings too. Uh, you forgive them for their shortcomings, but you learn from it. And you don't just say, I'm going to be the opposite. No, you say, what I needed and didn't receive, all that I needed and didn't receive, I'm going to go to God and receive it righteously. Jeremiah 2.13, uh, for filling our emotional needs, is a, a, a verse of scripture that we used often. My people have committed two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountain, and they've hewn for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that really hold no water. Two sins. They've forsaken me, and they've hewn for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns. So I'm going to go over a list of needs, and I want to pray for you because some of you are going to get deliverance just watching this. Value. Do you believe that God says that's a legitimate need for every? every person on the face of the earth, to have a sense of personal value? Absolutely. Personal worth? Identity? I'm a one of a kind. I have a need for that identity. To know who it is that God made me. And if you want to look to the purpose of a thing or the identification of a thing, look to the creator. Don't look to the creation for answers. Purpose. Purpose, when it's not known, will cause abuse to be inevitable. That's right. If you are not operating in the purposes that God has ordained for you, you will abuse. You will abuse your life, and it's inevitable that abuse will take place. You'll find some counterfeit uh, substitute for what God has for you often wonder about many musical people that defied God, even in their songs and in their lyrics, and how wonderful they would have been to take that talent and become worshipers 
of the living God and used it wisely, but they found a counterfeit, a substitute. How that power, that the prince of the power of the air, their father the devil, even taking Christian kids who had Christian parents and taking them and causing them to feel like they've accomplished purpose without God. The pride, the exaggeration, the exaltation, the domination, all of that arrogance. But pride leads to a fall. How about approval and acceptance? Validation. Uh, how about even a sense of belonging? And, you know, keep in mind, there, there were people that were raised without an earthly father. There were orphans. There were single parents who raised children without a father, and uh, vice versa. There's a solution to all of that. If you will forgive that earthly parent, you stand in the place to where you can receive righteously. If you don't get these needs met, you will find a cistern or a substitute for value, worth, purpose. It'll either be an addiction, could even be in something that's fine, like education, but you can make a god out of anything. You can make an idol out of money, education, work. You can make an idol out of family, power. I've seen some families made such an idol out of family that they never grew up and became the parent. It's just like we're all kids and we're all going to have fun the rest of our life. Achievements, hobbies, trophies, things to make you feel like you accomplished something. Those are substitutes. But the true answer, and this is where we've seen deliverance take place in a multitude of ways, is when you see all that I needed and didn't receive. I'm going to take that from God and I'm going to have that need met righteously. In other words, you know what the characteristics of God are. You let, you let his word depict his character, his nature, and his attributes. And then you ask God that I release forgiveness for my lack and whoever I would have blamed even for that lack. And I receive forgiveness. I release forgiveness. I, I, I even release the judgments I made against God for not receiving this. But I'm going to recognize that anything that is contrary to my new creation reality is a false personality under a false influence. Now, if you've been living under a false influence, I want to close with a description of my father and your father. And it's taken from the love chapter. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 to 8. Let's just interject a word here. My father is patient and kind. My father is not envious and never boastful. My father, your father. My father is never rude or selfish, nor arrogant. My father is not quick to take offense. My father does not keep a score of wrong. He doesn't keep hold grudges. He doesn't keep a record of wrongs. My father doesn't gloat over my sins, but rejoices when truth prevails in my life. My father knows no limits to his endurance or to the end of his trust. He is faithful. My father is always hopeful and patient because my father never fails. Your father never fails. In Jesus' name, set us free. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com.